Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for being here today. Uh, such an important topic that uh, I know we all as mental health providers have been think thinking about uh, a ton. What we're really going to focus on today is the young adult mind. And we're going to look at this from a biological, psychological, social, and spiritual standpoint. And really, really, Really think about how young adults um, are being impacted by by 2020, which has certainly been uh, a year like none other. For this first part of the presentation, I'm really going to focus on the psychological, the social, and the spiritual. And then in the second half of the presentation, we're going to be looking a little bit more uh, specifically at the biological and how that plays into everything. But before I start, I think it's really important to look at this young adulthood stage of development uh, outside of a pandemic. Because even in the best of times, it's really hard being a young adult today. There are a ton of different developmental milestones that young adults are striving to achieve, such as autonomy and a sense of independence. Uh, really solidifying their identity. We know that in adolescence, young people are really starting to establish their identity, but this really goes well into young adulthood. And as I'm sure many of us have seen and even experienced, college represents a really critical time for experimenting with an identity and really trying to figure out who, uh, who you are. Also developing emotional stability and coping skills, starting to think about a career. What do I wanna do with my life when I leave college, when I grow up? Finding intimacy. And when I say this a step farther than maybe the relationships that you were in in high school, and this is both romantic and platonic intimacy because the way that we look at intimacy is an ability to really let somebody get to know you as you get to know the real them. In young adulthood, uh, young people are still trying to become part of a group or a larger community. They may be learning how to live by themselves and manage an independent household or apartment or dorm room. And then finally, really trying to look at who they are from a an moral and ethical perspective and developing that moral and ethical compass. What we know too is that outside of coronavirus, uh, young people struggle. And 60% of college students say that they wish they had more emotional preparation going into college. They feel emotionally unprepared. Academically, you know, they have studied, they've taken tests, they've gone into the school they want to go to, but they get to there and emotionally they're just not equipped to manage and navigate a college landscape. And this is only compounded by the fact that what we know is that 30% of undergraduates are living with some kind of mental health disorder. And then we have a global pandemic and a very defining moment in, in history. And with this global pandemic, we have seen disruption of life as we know it on a level that we have not seen in our recent memories. Uh, we're seeing economic depression, financial insecurity, and on top of all of this, there are stressors around a very, very heated political climate and an election year, racial justice, climate crisis, the amount of environmental catastrophes that we're seeing this year. This is all contributing to stress and certainty and disillusionment in the population in general, but especially for the young adults that we treat. From a psychological standpoint, what we're seeing is that 40% of young people are reporting elevated mental health conditions or concerns. Anxiety rates at this time this year are three times what they were at the same time last year. 
and the most vulnerable groups are, in addition to minorities, essential workers, and unpaid adult caregivers, are young adults, which is actually fascinating because younger people, statistically speaking, are less hard hit physically from coronavirus, but they seem to be very hard hit from a mental health perspective. In June 2020, in a survey that was done, 10.7% of respondents reported having seriously considered suicide in the 30 days prior to completing the survey. And this number was highest amongst individuals in that young adult range, 18 to 24. Grief, trauma, re-traumatization seem to be the new normal for, for young people amidst this pandemic. From a social perspective, uh, you know, young people are being forced to distance themselves from their peers, who are really their most important community, and live life behind a screen more so than ever, whether it's school, part-time jobs, socializing, it's all being done from behind a screen. In July of 2020, 52% of young adults resided with one or both of their parents. And this is up from 47% in February. So basically during a time in the developmental life cycle where young people and young adults are starting to leave the home and go to college, which helps them to accomplish some of these developmental milestones and social milestones, they are now stuck at home with parents living in a sense their adolescent lives. And what we're seeing is young people are missing out on these daily connections. Um, you know, just even being able to walk into the park and meet up with a bunch of friends for a coffee or an outdoor lunch or a soccer game, walking to the local deli to get your sandwich, to order a cup of coffee. All these micro connections add up and are really important in the life of young people. And they're really important for social growth and for social health. They're also missing out on some bigger social milestones like meeting new people at college, um, being given new roommates who they have to navigate relationships with, being able to join new clubs or athletic teams, all of these possibilities for, um, for feeling a sense of um, accomplishment socially and feeling connected socially are, are, are now missing. And like I said early, most of these interactions are, are taking place online. And because there are fewer opportunities for social connections and for social engagements, what we are seeing with our young adult population is that they are not able to practice really essential social and emotional skills that are a vital part of both adolescence and young adulthood and prepare young people to experience success as they go into an adult stage of development where they're working, where they're getting married, where they're raising families. So when I talk about social emotional literacy skills, I'm talking about things like self-awareness, self-management, emotion regulation, decision-making skills, relationship skills. These are all skills and like any other skill, the more you practice them, the better you get at them. And when you're not practicing them, you, you lose them and you, you lose your confidence in your ability to be able to utilize them effectively. The last sort of piece of the psychological, social uh, impact of coronavirus that I wanna talk about is, is the spiritual component. Um, you know, when we do, 
biopsychosocial assessments at the dorm. We, we actually call them biopsychosocial spiritual assessments because what we know is that the spiritual, existential, ideological um, development is, is super important and that it is actually really meaningful to many young people. And with coronavirus, uh, many young people are experiencing a bit of an existential uh, crisis and it's causing them to question certain spiritual and ideological values and to feel less taken care of on a spiritual level. One of the things that our young adult clients tell us that they love about being able to go to college and, and leave the home is that there's a very natural opportunity when they go to college to connect with people outside of the family system um, on a more ideological level. So maybe that's um, a college professor that they admire um, and that has very different either social or political views than their family of origin that feels more congruent with who the young person is than maybe even their own parent. Maybe that's um, a group of peers that are a part of uh, an extracurricular club at college that um, participates in either advocacy work or volunteer work that they feel really passionate about that when they grew up, um, their hometown or their high school didn't give them any opportunity to partake in. And, and being able to participate in these types of things in a college environment is really powerful and empowering and help solidify a sense of identity and that ethical and moral compass that we were talking about earlier. And not having these opportunities can feel really depleting um, for a young person, especially when this was something that they were specifically looking forward to. And this was something that they were saying, I can't wait until I am X years old, I get to go to college and I get to leave my home and really branch out and discover who I am in these more spiritual and ideological capacities. So before I, I turn the presentation over um, to Dr. Barron, I really, I wanna sort of bring this to light with uh, more of a case example, because I think these concepts are, they come to life when you talk about them in regards to a specific client. Uh, and the client that I have in mind is a client who we, uh, we were working with at the dorm and we were working with this particular individual. Uh, they were taking a gap year. So they had not yet been to college. And um, this young person identifies as being transgender and uh, doesn't really feel that their home that they grew up in um, is, is an affirming home. And they definitely don't see eye to eye um, ideologically, politically with their parents um, and have, have really felt stifled in, in this environment. The high school that they went to didn't feel like the right fit. And uh, you know, they were struggling uh, socially, for sure, because they didn't feel like they fit in, um, struggling with uh, some trauma, uh, some, some, some depression and anxiety as well. And we, we took this gap year to really help stabilize this individual, um, first with their depression and their trauma symptoms, also to try to do some, some family work and get them prepared socially and emotionally to, to go to college. And, and we got there. And they were so excited to be able to go to college. And then coronavirus hit. And, uh, you know, the family and, and the young person both didn't really feel comfortable with the hybrid learning that was going to be taking place on the college campus. And the decision was made um, to stay home, which was a severe blow to this individual. And we really wanted to figure out a way at the dorm to help this young person and many other young people who aren't able to have this normal sort of college experience this year because of coronavirus to still be able to accomplish some of the things that a college environment provides them with at the dorm. So 
for this young person, it was really taking this time now that they're home to, even though they're living at home, to try to make the home environment as congruent with launching as is possible. So that means really helping the parents to take a step back and not wake the young person up every morning, not make them every meal. The young person's in charge of doing grocery shopping, cooking some meals, being their own alarm clock, doing their own virtual schoolwork, and then providing them with opportunities outside of the home to fulfill some of those social, emotional, and ideological, spiritual needs that they, that they have. So for instance, um, getting involved in a variety of different social groups at the dorm that are less, you know, skills based and more fun based because they really wanted opportunities to, to have fun and connect with peers. Getting them involved in service, community service, specifically in the LGBTQ community, um, so that they could begin feeling like they are participating in activities that are aligned with who they are who they are from an identity perspective, who their values are to make them feel good about themselves while working on the side with the parents to be more affirming. Uh, they are involved in a advocacy group at the dorm as well, which takes on different initiatives, allows peers, like-minded peers to come together and develop their own moral compasses with one another. But it really meant getting creative with the programming that we had them do on site here and that their coaches helped them find outside of the dorms. So even though they are still at home and participating in treatment at the dorm and not at college as originally was planned and as they really as they were really looking forward to do, trying to make home New York City and, and treatment as um, congruent with the desire to sort of launch and address some of those social, emotional, and spiritual um, milestones as, as is possible. And, you know, I think that as mental health professionals right now, we're really being challenged to think outside of the box, to be fluid, to be creative, we're all trying this for the first time. None of us have, has ever practiced uh, mental health treatment during a pandemic like coronavirus. Uh, and what we're learning is that our clients tell us what they need. We just have to listen and get creative with providing some of those services. So with that, I'm gonna turn the presentation over to Dr. Barron and uh, we can hear a little bit more about some of the biological components. Thank you very much, Amanda. Uh, so uh, first of all, can everyone hear me? Just wave or not? Or, okay, great. Um, so I want to tell you uh, just a brief introduction to who I am and uh, what Yellow Brick is to give you a context for what I'm going to talk about. Um, and that is, uh, so I'm a psychiatrist. I've been practicing about 30 years. And my, my work has always been a roughly equal combination of administrative and uh, direct clinical work. I've been doing uh, psychiatry and psychotherapy throughout that time. I still do. And I've been in various administrative roles, and uh, which have landed me eventually at Yellow Brick as the medical director. Um, Yellow Brick is a treatment program for emerging adults. We're located in Evanston, Illinois. And we are doing our best to combine the uh, most cutting edge aspects of neuropsychoanalytic thinking and interpersonal psychotherapeutic techniques, along with uh, an intensive uh, partial hospital level of programming ranging from that on down to uh, intensive outpatient. Uh, and working with what, really what we've become known for within, at least within the industry, is uh, working with some of the most challenging emerging adults, roughly ages 16 to mid thirties. So, just as a quick example, about uh, two thirds of the people who come here have made a suicide attempt and half of those have made more than one. And two thirds of the people who come here have a substance or alcohol abuse problem uh, along with a psychiatric diagnosis. So we're, we're working with very challenging people. They tend to have been to several other treatment facilities before coming here. On average, I think it's 2.3. And usually they're good ones. They're, they're not just going to uh, someplace uh, you know, that doesn't know what they're doing and they still are not really kind of turning the corner. 
So that's, that's our population. Um, along with the psychotherapeutic interventions that we do, we put a strong emphasis on neuroregulatory technologies. So as part of a much more complicated and comprehensive program where people really live here and are deeply immersed in relationships and groups and the intensity of challenging oneself to change your behaviors and change the way you know and, and experience yourself. Um, we use some direct technological interventions and I'm going to be talking about one of them uh, today. So that's just as a little background. So that um, intervention is called neurofeedback and the basis of neurofeedback is something called quantitative EEG. Um, just by a show of hands, how many people have heard of EEG? Okay, of the people who've heard of it, how many of you know what it is? You feel like you have some understanding of what it represents. Okay, all right, I see some waving hands, I see some blank screens and I see some hands up, so I'm gonna explain it a little more fully. Um, quantitative EEG, is, uh, it's a form of electroencephalography. So if you've ever had a relative or yourself have been evaluated for epilepsy, your neurologist or your internist would send you to a neurologist and they would put some electrodes on your scalp that get attached with some adhesive and it's a pain to take off, but it, you know, it doesn't take the skin with it. Um, and uh, they look at your brain waves and it's a measurement of your brain waves. And the output of that would be a bunch of squiggly lines that are showing you various brain waves in various locations on your skull um, reading the electrical activity of your brain because your brain conducts its activity through electricity. That's how all our nerve cells talk to each other. Quantitative EEG is taking that information and putting it through a computer algorithm. And that computer program is comparing the brain waves of the person who's, who's being studied with very large databases of thousands, in fact, tens of thousands of other people who do not have disrupted brainwave activity, which is the same thing as saying they do not have psychiatric symptoms, they do not have serious emotional challenges, they are not substance abusing, they are functioning in a normal way and feeling relatively normal. So it's really a normative population. And what the quantitative EEG tells us is uh, how do you compare to that group of people? How close are you to that normative population or how far away are you? So that's, that's kind of the basic background. It's a very objective measure and uh, it tends to quantify. It's, it, it's uh, giving us uh, statistical information. It's statistically significant and compares you with these normative databases. Uh, it's relevant uh, as, a, as a clinical finding only if your findings are two standard deviations away from a comparison norm. So. If, if anyone remembers, or if you haven't taken the statistics, if you, you've all seen a bell curve, in the center of the bell curve is the average person. If it's a bell curve about IQ, then the center of that bell curve is an IQ of 100. Uh, if you're in the center of the bell curve on an EEG, you have no findings. If you're within one standard deviation, that means a little bit to the right or the left at the center of that bell curve then it's not clinically significant. It, it's only if you're two or more standard deviations from that average that it's considered clinically significant. It's also providing a, a dimension of assessment that is very different from how we usually go about and, and how we do at Yellow Brick, go about talking to people and uh, coming up with a DSM diagnosis and getting to know people in a more deep psychological way than DSM is capable of. As we all know, it has its limitations. Um, but what's really interesting is that when we do the quantitative EEG and they're analyzed by an expert, it, they very often, in fact, most often, converge with those more subjective findings. And they can be very confirming, robustly confirming of what we're doing in a more, in a more ordinary clinical diagnostic process. Or occasionally, they may show us some differences that are really clinically meaningful and significant, and they help us pay attention in ways we might not otherwise. So here's an example of a quantitative EEG, and I'll walk you through it. This is from an actual person who's been in treatment, it's been de-identified. And if anyone in this audience can tell me who this person is from looking at this map, then you've gone to school for it and studied it and practiced it for 20 years. 
and you're probably much better than our expert because I asked him to identify this person before I brought it to the talk today, and he couldn't. Um, I'll tell you in a minute something he does do that's pretty amazing, but he couldn't do that. Okay, so here's a person who, now that you'll see, uh, has any of you seen an MRI before? A picture of an MRI? A few of you have. It's that gray part of the picture here, all the gray uh, squiggly lines. Um, if in the second picture from the left, the middle one, where uh, you see some red markings toward the top and yellow in the middle, it's the gray below that. That's, that is somebody's MRI, but it's not the MRI of the person whose quantitative EEG is being represented here. This is a standard uh, reference range MRI. It's just a way of anatomically locating the EEG findings. So they take a volunteer's MRI, superimpose this color on the MRI, and the color is what we're interested. What the color represents is a statistical map. So anywhere where you see it yellow, that's not really that significant. That's one standard deviation from the mean. So we're not gonna really pay attention to that. But where it's orange and red, the orange is a little hard to see because there's very little of it, but it tends to be between the yellow and the red in this particular map. Um, it's almost dead center in that middle picture and it's uh, in the kind of upper right quadrant of the third picture on the right is the orange. That's two standard deviations from the mean and that's significant. And all of the red is three or more standard deviations. So if something is three standard devi deviations from the mean, what that means in statistics is there is a 99.73% chance that that's not normal. That's how statistics work. It tells us the likelihood that something is within that normal database. So for this person, in the frequency range of 21 to 34 hertz, which is 21 to 34 cycles per second, which everyone has in their brain, in those locations where it's red, this person is 99.73% likely not to be having normal function in those areas of the brain. Actually, the z-score on this one, which is the number of standard deviations, is 4.1. And I don't even remember how high that number is, but it's way beyond 99.73%. This is clearly somebody whose brain is dysregulated. This is someone who, in their high beta range, which is high frequency brain activity, um, they are really struggling. Now, what does that mean? Well, the, the narrative here is something that our expert, who is a someone who just does quantitative EEG and neurofeedback has come up with. And he does these narratives without meeting the patient, without knowing their history. The only thing he knows is their name, their age, their gender, uh, actually sex at birth, um, because these are based on sex at birth, not on identified gender, and their handedness, are they left or right handed. He will also know what medications they're on, although most medications don't have a profound impact on this. So uh, although they can have a subtle impact and he'll make note of that. He comes up with this narrative description. So what he says is uh, you don't have to pay that much attention to the anatomic reference locations. That's what all the Brodman and postcentral gyrus mean. But he says a functional characteristic of these areas includes visual motor coordination and symptoms associated with these areas include being easily distracted, difficulty with social cues, denial, you can look at this and say, how likely is it that this person exercises denial and or obsession? And we tend to think of obsession as obsessionality, not necessarily having obsessive compulsive disorder, but having an obsessional style. So we sit down then at a, at a conference where we talk to patients about their assessment, including, but not only, their quantitative EEG, and they read these, and sometimes they're, they're sobbing. They're saying, my parents have been telling me I'm just lazy. Or why can't you stop thinking about that? Why can't you get your mind off that obsession you have? Or how come you can't pay attention? You know, just buckle up and do it or buckle down. And um, this is saying, well, here's why. Your brain's not working right and you can't fake it. Our, our joke here, uh, pardon me for looking over at the screen all the time because I'm trying to read notes at the same time. So I'm looking at you and the picture. Um, the, the, the only person who could fake this would be someone like the Dalai Lama. Um, but if you're the Dalai Lama, you probably wouldn't fake it because 
he's too honest. So here's, here's another, uh, we go to the next one. This is Alpha. Um, so just to, to give you more of the background, we all have a lot of different frequency regions in our brain all the time. Uh, they're, uh, they don't run in alphabetical order in Greek, unfortunately, it makes it more difficult to learn. But alpha is one of the mid-range frequencies and high beta that we looked at on the last slide is one of the higher frequency ranges. If you have a lot of high beta activity, it's associated with problem solving. And if you're constantly trying to solve a problem for which there is no solution, that's what we call anxiety. So if we look at alpha here, alpha tends to be a range where uh, if you go to sleep and you have a good night's sleep, you wake up in the morning, you haven't really started doing anything yet, but you're feeling rested and you're ready for your day, you're gonna have a kind of moderate amount of alpha activity. It's gonna be more, one of the more dominant activities in your brain at that point in your day. And people who have trouble generating alpha activity or have, who have uh, dysregulated alpha activity have a hard time calming themselves down. So again, without going into all the technical details here, you see all these red areas and they're in the temporal lobe and the superior temple gyrus. These are just correlating where are these dysregulated waves occurring and what is the function of that part of the brain and how is it likely to affect that function? And what he says is these functions include emotional regulation and auditory processing. Um, this is someone who we found through other means has an auditory processing problem. The guy who wrote this report didn't know that. He just looked at her brain waves. So people with this, uh, these kinds of findings tend to have import, impaired emotional regulation, difficulty controlling anger. This is someone who has had a lot of tantrums and uh, tended to use substances in the past to try to regulate that, uh, unsuccessfully, of course, in the long run, and auditory sequencing. So um, we, we show these people, we show people these photos, these, uh, let's go back one, please. Yeah, we show them these images. Um, it's sometimes incredibly validating. Sometimes parents too are, are looking at these and saying, oh my goodness, I can't believe I've been so critical of you when this is how your brain is functioning. Um, another way of looking at this is, you know, we've been talking, hearing in the first part of the, of the uh, discussion today about how um, the macro is looking so troubling during coronavirus and the pandemic, and people are having trouble with their emotional stability. This is a very alarming macro picture. This is the micro picture. This is what people's brains are likely to look like when they're under the duress of something like a pandemic. And it's the same thing. Mind is brain. They aren't two different things. We don't have a great language for discussing both at the same time. So let's move on. What do we do about this? Well, what we do about this is actually everything we do. So to anyone doing comprehensive treatment, the dorm or yellow brick or anywhere else is um, trying to combine interventions to get the best effect and, and engage people in a collaborative way to achieve that effect. So what do we do we, with this particular finding? We do something called neurofeedback. Now, neurofeedback is a form of biofeedback. Uh, some forms of biofeedback use sensors like uh, galvanic skin response to measure your sweating or look at your blood pressure or your heart rate. Well, this is looking directly at your brain waves. So you, what, basically what you do is you play a video game, but instead of using a controller, you just use your brain. So let's look at what that looks like. Uh, we have the slide slightly out of order. Okay, this is uh, back one, please. Uh, we need to go to the, uh, on, my, on my slides, it's 19. Yeah, this one, thank you. Okay, this is what a video game looks like. You, this is one of them. It's a, this is actually a, a blimp race. So if you can see that one of the blimps, it's got a yellow line above and below it, is leading the race. And the better you do on your neurofeedback, the more your blimp stays in the lead. Let's move to the next one. Or you can play Brain Man. Uh, the better you do on the neurofeedback, the less likely the monsters are to catch your Brain Man. Or you can do this one, and I'm gonna show you what it actually looks like. So. For neurofeedback, if you can switch the uh, screen over to me. Uh, 
And bear with me one second while I change my settings here so you can actually hear what I'm doing and see what I'm doing. Okay. And one more setting. Well, I had this setting before, but I don't. Uh, rather than spend time with me setting it up, I'm going to uh, I'm going to find the right screen. Let me try one more time here. Here we go. Can everyone see uh, what looks like a dashboard and some squiggly lines? Okay. So you hear that beeping. This is a person attached by EEG electrodes, usually just a couple as they focus on one area at a time, to the computer. The computer is reading their brain waves, which you're seeing actually across the top here. They're in different frequency ranges. This is the high beta frequency range, the low beta frequency range, and this is theta, one we hadn't talked about already. And what they're trying to do is keep, looks like we, we just lost our picture. Ah, okay, hang on. We didn't lose our picture. Let me go back and show you again. Okay, uh, they're trying to keep those lines in between these, all right, you see the blue one going here? They're trying to keep that in the middle, they're trying to keep this in the middle. And they're trying to keep these uh, thermometers in this range between the two little clips. And, and I'll, I'll pause here to get to, so that annoying sound will stop. Um, if we go forward here, they can do it that way, the way you just saw, by looking at a dashboard or they can do it by playing the video game. And here's another one of the video games. Can you all still hear me? Okay. So this is an eagle. The eagle's flying. And you see behind the eagle, there are uh, kind of uh, flashy dots coming out. There's, a, there's some very bright ones coming out straight out the back of the eagle. And then they're off the wingtips, there's some fainter ones coming out. Um, so if we, uh, let's go back to that eagle. There we go. So more of the beeps you were hearing, I think you could hear them in the background, means more positive feedback. Um, on the eagle's flight, the brighter trail, this one in the middle here, that means you're reducing your beta wave power. That's a good thing. The fainter trail, these dots in the periphery here around the wingtips, if you get more of those, you're increasing your alpha power. And the overall effect is if you do well, you get the eagle to fly through these hoops. So if you've got these electrodes on your brain and you say, fly through the hoops, fly through the hoops, what is that doing? It's increasing your tension and it doesn't work. So what people are instructed to do is relax. Just try to focus on a steady concentration. Concentrate on the eagle. Uh, concentrate on the tone. Notice what your mind's doing. You're actually not thinking about the game in order to make the game be most successful. And what's happening as you um, as you participate in this, is that your brain is doing something it isn't used to doing. It's changing these wave frequencies away from how they trend. Human brains are lazy. They want to keep doing what they know how to do. They want to keep drinking. They want to keep uh, hooking up as a way to self-soothe. They want to keep avoiding because that helps anxiety in the short run. They want to keep doing all of what we know how to do. And what this is saying is, well, do something different, but at a very micro level. And you get your brain waves to function differently. And I think this one is successful. This person threw the hoop. Yes, yes. Last minute. 
No, they didn't quite make it. Okay, but on several of them in this video, they do make it through the hoop. Let's give her another chance here. We're gonna make it through the hoop. There we go, good job. And the good job is the, the eagle doing the flip, doing that roll. Um, so all of those are forms of feedback. And every time the person successfully does that, they are retraining their brain. And when brains are retraining, neurons that fire together, wire together, and you actually make new circuits in your brain and your brain gets used to doing something different than it was doing before. And that's what this is about. So uh, I'm, I'm open to questions about this. I know there'll be time for questions. Um, if people uh, wanna know more about Yellow Brick, please feel free to contact me or Tom Maisel, who's also on this uh, video chat. And I thank you very much for, uh, for participating. I'll take the screen back. David, thank you for that. Thank you as well. Uh, My pleasure for this uh, for this thoughtful and, uh, and and informative presentation. I I wanted to leave uh, ten or so minutes for for questions, and I see that a couple have already come in. Um, why don't we start with Michelle's, um, as I think it it really relates directly to uh, to the neurofeedback example, David, you just mentioned. Um, her question is, uh, what do they do to impact their performance on the neurofeedback game? Relax, breathe, concentrate. Any, uh, any additional points that you want to make to that? It, what, a way to look at it is, uh, yes to all of those. And a way to look at it is it's, um, it's electronically guided meditation. If you were guiding through someone, uh, guiding someone through a, a meditative process, if you're teaching someone how to do um, sitting uh, in, a, in a Zen style or doing transcendental meditation or doing a mindfulness exercise, um, you're giving them instructions. Uh, the, the instructions that come from the technician who facilitates neurofeedback are very similar, but actually the neurofeedback itself is guiding as well. Uh, whatever state you're getting yourself into, you can tell how close or how far you are from that state by the feedback you get on the screen and through the audio. So it's both. Appreciate that, David. Um, there's a couple of, of direct questions related to neurofeedback. So why don't we take five or so minutes and, and we can really direct those to you, David, and then we can follow up with more general as well to, uh, to bring you into the loop, sure. Amanda. Um, did you say they control the game with their brain? If so, could you explain again how that works? Yes, um, I, I, I'm reminded that I left one slide out and um, it, it's kind of an important one. So if I could take 30 seconds for that, um, let me move this out of the way so I can see what I'm showing. Yeah, these two are the same person at the beginning of treatment and at the end of treatment. Remember I said color is what makes it abnormal? This is one individual who went through treatment. Now it's not just neurofeedback treatment, it's all treatment. So everything that any treatment center does that helps people better self-regulate and relate to themselves in a better way achieves effects that would look like this if you did a quantitative EEG. This is a particularly, of course, we're gonna show you the most dramatic example because I wanna make the point. They don't all look quite this good, but they frequently look very good. Um, treatment at yellow brick tends to be four to six months on average. So just to give you a sense of how powerful, um, even just how powerful a diagnostic tool EEG is, but this also speaks somewhat to the power of neurofeedback and, and of engaging in any intensive treatment in a meaningful way. So um, sorry, I, I wanted to not leave that out, but. There were other questions. I appreciate that. Uh, there was one question that came in from Donna. If a person is on medication for uh, mood regulation, does that in particular affect quantitative EEG findings and or effectiveness of, of neurofeedback? Yeah, um, it does not affect the effectiveness of neurofeedback. It has no negative impact on that. It may actually enhance it if, they're, if the medications are a good match to the symptoms being treated. Um, it does have some Depending on which medication, it can have a more or less noticeable effect on the quantitative EEG. But our electroencephalographer is pretty good at discerning what's from medication and what isn't. Mm -hmm. So the, the effects are not invisible, but they're not usually dramatic. Thank you. Have, have you studied this with a range of age groups? If so, how long do the effects last after intervention? 
Yeah, I personally am not a researcher. It has been studied with a range of age groups. The, the most robust research on neurofeedback has been done around ADHD. Mm -hmm. And if you look it up in the literature, uh, that's where most of the evidence basis comes from. However, in the hands of experts, and, and I think in combination with other treatment approaches, it has a much wider applicability than for ADHD. Um, also, by the way, it's a, it's a reimbursable uh, form of psychotherapy under most insurance plans. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, David, if you can speak to um, the frequency and duration of neurofeedback right. sessions. Uh, so typically here we do it three times a week. Um, the, uh, what we're told, and it's, it's been our experience that's validated this, is that to have a lasting effect, to address the lasting effect question, you have to have approximately 50 5 repetitions. So three times a week, that's about 17 weeks. It can be done more frequently. Uh, there are people who do it every day, five days a week. Um, we have other interventions along with it that, that probably enhance its, uh, its efficacy. But if you were doing neurofeedback alone, the kind of general wisdom is you have to do it at least 50 times before the neurons are rewiring, just not firing. Thank you for that. I have a, an 11-month-old daughter crying in the other room, so apologies if you're, if you're hearing her behind me. Um, Brain is doing what it's used to. Indeed. <laughs> indeed. I just wanted to bring uh, Karen into the conversation here. Karen, you had asked a question early on um, in thinking about something positive. I, uh, I was hoping to, to bring you on to speak a little bit more to this question more directly. Please feel free to unmute yourself. Um, so actually, I, I asked that question rather early on, um, having seen the PowerPoint. And basically, though, after seeing the neurofeedback presentation, I am thinking that people this age still have neuroplasticity, they still have, they're still moving trains. And that's where my question is. And how are you thinking of doing this or working with people who may have been isolated, may have not had all of their social interactions they were going to have? How can we harness what's strong about young adults after? things not go back to normal, but people are able to interact more face-to-face. -face. Yeah. Amanda, do you want to take that? You're muted. I'm muted and I don't have a crying 11 month old in my office. Um, so yeah, well, first of all, I think it, it is such an important point to bring up that you know, development is still very much happening in young adulthood and the brain is still developing. And I think that not everybody necessarily realizes that. Um, and as such, um, you know, as a mental health provider working with, with young people and working with young adults, um, there's still so much of an impact that, that we can have. And there's so much um, change that can take place. And that is a positive thing. And I think it's always, sort of, especially in times like this, where, you know, <laughs> life feels very hard and feels very difficult. It's always important to sort of look at the silver linings and find the um, potential areas for growth and the good that can come out of these situations. And, and I do think that there is a lot that can be done in these situations um, from a treatment perspective. Like I said, as long as we're able to be flexible, fluid, and creative in our um, approaches, uh, you know, in, in looking at, um, and I'm, I'll, I'll leave it to Dr. Barron to speak to the biological sides of it, but in looking at things from more of a social emotional perspective, what we've always sort of said is that, um, you know, while coronavirus, um, has sort of dictated, um, for our own physical safety that we need to create distance, 
um, distance doesn't need to mean isolation. And how do we create programming that helps us to be connected even when we maybe need to be a little bit more distant from one another? And right now, you know, I think some programs are totally virtual, some are more hybrid, but nobody's operating as if everything is normal. You, you can't. So there's not as much opportunities for um, the face-to-face -face social interactions, which we know have such a positive impact on the brain in so many different ways. Um, so what are we doing to supplement um, and to compensate for, for that? Um, and I think that um, providing as many opportunities for connection to people, other people within their peer groups, and connection to causes, to activities, whether that's volunteering, whether that's hobbies, whether that's, um, you know, a new the volunteer group that they want to become a part of anything that makes somebody feel connected to a cause good about themselves is also going to help with um, the brain with feeling better and with doing better socially and right now because so many people are struggling and because there is, you know, we're in the midst of so many different crises, there actually are a ton of opportunities to get involved and to feel like you're being impactful in this world. And for a young adult, I think that that goes a, a very, very long way. These are things that drive young people when they can find these things. So sometimes it has to be virtual volunteering. Sometimes it has to be virtual hobbies virtual museum tours, virtual board games, virtual talent shows, like, you know, all these things that we're doing in the off hours. Um, but these are the opportunities to stay socially connected because when you're not socially connected, especially as a young person to peers, that's when we begin to see, you know, I think shutting down um, on, on numerous different levels. Yeah, I think um, if you think about um, putting, I really want to put politics aside, difficult as that may be to do these days, but putting politics aside, if you see how many people respond to the public health advice, stay home, stay relatively isolated, stay six feet apart, put on a mask, lots of people aren't doing that. You know, it's different in different locations, but there are plenty of people, we wouldn't keep having spikes of coronavirus if that weren't the case. It's not just because people are mad. It's not just because they object politically. It's because we're being advised to ignore a biological imperative, which is affiliation with other people. And our affiliation with other people is not just about the psychology of it, or, or a better way to say it would be the psychology and social aspects of it are a manifestation of the biological imperative and we, have these biological systems in us that are part of how we connect to other people. We have, a, there's a lot of nonverbal information we convey to each other all the time that isn't available this way. Some of it is, but lots of it isn't. And lots of it we're not aware of when we sit in a room with someone else and look at them face to face without a mask on. There's a whole level of interpersonal nourishment that's going on that we don't even have to think about. It just happens. So that, that chronic tension and stress that we're all living with, um, there, there are plenty of things we know and are conscious of about what that is, but there's also a whole world of, of our biological interactions with each other that we're being deprived of. And uh, it, it's, uh, I don't know what to do about out and sick. Uh, that's partly luck, but it's also being really rigorous but not totally giving up the face-to-face. -face. We're doing a lot of video conferencing. We're doing, um, we're, we're not putting big groups of people together in a room like we used to. Uh, but we, we knew that if we totally gave it up, we'd, we'd be, you know, we'd be killing treatment. So uh, it, at least in our setting, we would be because it's so intensive. Uh, but, you know, it's very difficult to live without that face-to-face -face interaction for everybody. It doesn't matter if you're in treatment or not. Indeed. Dr. Barron, thank you for, the, for that point. Um, and it's certainly something we've seen 
at the dorm as well. Um, we operate presently on a hybrid Monday, Wednesday, Friday in person, Tuesday, Thursday virtual. And uh, it's, it's been incredible for us to see the, the interest in wanting to return in person. Um, you know, d dis despite the rigors of, of wearing a mask throughout an entire treatment day and staying socially distanced and, um, you know, everything that comes along to operating on site in this day and age. So I think it really speaks to, to that particular point. And that's a nice way to close out today's meeting. Um, I just wanted to thank you all. I, I know that we had uh, one question from a Karen in regards to psychiatrists that are doing neurofeedback. I'm going to encourage you to, to reach out to Tom Mizell and, and Dr. Barron. Um, they are both fantastic resources, even nationally, to, to help with locating providers uh, that really speak the same language. In addition to myself or, or Amanda Falk, we'll, uh, we'll have an email out to your inbox by the end of the day today with all of our contact information and uh, look forward to keeping this conversation going. So with that, thank you all. Um, enjoy the, uh, the minute you have before your four o'clock. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Bye guys.